first of all, let me say I'm very honored and privileged to be here. I appreciate your time and, and the invitation. Um, whenever I start talking about domestic violence, I always usually have this little PowerPoint that comes up and plays the music from the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's not working right now, I apologize, but I'll explain to you why I kind of do that. I think in the domestic violence field, we've done a lot of good things in the last 20 years. When I was a kid, I grew up in a home where my mother was battered at a time when they did not arrest the assailant. And at one time when he ended up, I got in the middle of those arguments and I got hurt and I was taken to the hospital, the police officers came in and they talked to me and they said something like, well, you're a good kid. Normally kids from homes like yours, you're in a lot of trouble. And to me, as being a fifth grader, I thought they did some type of criminal background check on me. Like, how do these cops know if I'm a good kid or not? I could have cheated in school or whatever, right? And uh, they told me I would get to go home, that my mom did nothing wrong, that my stepdad was the one who did something, you know, that he was the one that misbehaved. But they never arrested him. A few minutes later, maybe an hour later, a social worker came in and spoke to me, also said that my mother did nothing wrong, that I would get to go home. Several hours later, after they're done x-raying, you know, my arm and my ribs and my nose and all the stuff that they thought were injured, um, some gray-haired old man comes in and he says, I'm going home with you. I says, no, I'm not. I get to go home. You know, the cops said I get to go home and no one has more authority than the guys with the guns. Right? And they're like, but the cops weren't there. And I said, the social worker said I got to go home. And they said, well, she's the one that called us. You're going home with us. So what did I learn about the system at fifth, in fifth grade? That you people lie, right? That the police lie, that social workers lie, that these nurses weren't there to protect me. My mom was gone, and I got ripped out to a totally different school. When I was ripped into that different school, we had totally different assignments. I was at a law, I had no idea what long division was. And all of a sudden, I'm expected to perform. And all I wanted to know was what was going on with my mom. They also took my sisters away from the home because they thought they were in danger. And I had one sister who was an infant. She was nine months old, and you had to have a special license for that. So as kids didn't even get to go into the same home. We were all ripped out and placed in different parts of our community. <clears throat> so for us, when we finally got to go home, everybody in school wanted to know where have you been? And what did you have to say? Foster care? You know, then they, you're not focused focusing in school, you're behind, so they diagnosed you learning disability. They diagnosed you with ADHD. Then the system decided that we were having problems adjusting, so we would go to counseling on Tuesday night. Tuesday night used to be the night that I went out and played with my friends and played baseball. Now all my friends want to know what? Why aren't you coming to baseball? What am I going to say? I'm going to counseling? And I remember the last time leaving the counseling center, I turned around and I looked at the therapist. I said, why are you talking to me? He's the son of a gun who's hitting everybody. Talk to him. And at that point, all the system did really is tell my mother what she had to do. She had to do more classes. She had to do all these things to get us right. We had to do a bunch of things. But nobody once ever made the batter do anything. He never had to take any responsibility. And I think we've changed since then. Now we make an arrest, which honestly, if they would have arrested Andy back in those days, even if they never would have prosecuted him, the message to me would have been he was the one who did wrong. Somebody thought he did this. Instead, we were told my mom, the last time she was assaulted, the last time we were abused, and, and the system found out about it, they said, if you let him hit those kids again, you will never get them back. Did we ever report to social services again what happened? Did we ever call the police? Absolutely not. You trained us not to participate. Now, statistically, Jackson County could say that they were successful, right? We put all this money. We took these kids, put them into foster care. We sent them to counseling. We got them on medication. We put them in special ed. All these things to make us feel more worthless about ourselves, to make us feel more disempowered. And then they said, look it, they never came back again. And they were right. If their goal was just to get us out of the system, they succeeded. If their goal was to make our our family life safer and to make my mom more confident and a better parent they absolutely failed in fact when he battered after that he would say call the police here I'll dial the number for you do it lose your kids so all you did as a system you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on kids and families to empower batterers in your community we cannot do that. So when I want to say the good, the bad, and the ugly, I think there's a lot of good things that are happening, but when we go around the country, we still see batterers not being held to account all over. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what we can do to try to deal with that as a system. 
I kind of think that men batter because men speed. I speed on a pretty regular basis. I have a pretty fast little zippy car. I know in the state of Michigan where cops hide. They hide over hills and around corners. Where do I magically slow down? Over hills and around corners, right? I know if I take my foot off and I'm going 80, by the time I get to the top of the hill, I'll be going 70 and I'll wave at the cop. All right? I'm, I'm that clever. Um, if I get caught and once in a while there's a sneaky cop that catches me, right? Then I'm hoping that I'm not driving too fast and he'll look the other way. As long as you stay under 80, they're looking for the really bad speeder. And they just kind of dismiss that. If that fails and once in a while I've been caught in my life, I kind of hope that I can get off because of who I know. I have a badge. Right? I know judges. I'm connected in the community. So sometimes I get pulled over. Once I was on my way to the jail to do an interview and a police officer pulled, up, pulled me over and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm sorry. You're, I was talking to the judge. I'm on my way to do the jail interview and he let me go. So I live in a society where I can speed because I think everybody does it. I think I'm not as bad as the next guy. I think I'll get away with it. And ultimately, if I get caught and a cop says, I don't care that you weren't going 100 miles an hour. I don't care that you know the judge or you work for the court. I'm going to write you a ticket. If I go to trial and he doesn't show up, my case gets dismissed. So I know I can, and, it, and if that, if I, even if that fails, it'll be a cheap ticket. And I say batterers do the exact same thing. We batter where we think no one will catch us, right? We do it at home. We do it behind closed doors. We, we're sneaky that way. We know when to slow down, when not to batter. They also batter in a way where they think people might look the other way. I don't batter up my wife so bad that she's completely bruised up in the face. And if I do, I'm not going to let her leave. I'm going to batter in a way to where maybe you notice a bruise on her arm, but you're thinking, well, it's none of my business. If she wants to deal with it, if she wants to tell me, she'll tell me. Or you lie to me about it and I just accept that. I think, well, I kind of think she might be lying, but I'm not going to pry. So batters really rely on us to look the other way. They look on us to collude with them. They look at us to tolerate and accept that. I will suggest that I speed significantly less when I drive this truck. And the reason why is they charge me a dollar more a gallon than they do for gas. And it only gets 10 miles per gallon when I drive over 60. And it doesn't matter if a cop's there or not. It's a consistent consequence. Every time I drive over 60, I get horrible gas mileage. If I stay at 60, I can get 20 miles per gallon in that truck. That's not too bad. 10 miles is hard. So when there was a consistent consequence, Jim magically changed his driving behavior without any driving improvement classes. <laughs> I suggest that we could have batterers change their behavior if there was consistent consequences that they knew were going to be around the clock. <clears throat> So there's this concept called therapeutic jurisprudence. It's just a belief that all of us within the system, judges, probation officers, social workers, batterers, intervention providers, victim advocates, our actions and inactions sends a message to the assailants, to those they victimize, and to our community on what we feel about domestic violence. It either advances or impedes anybody's ability to make change. So let's say a victim reports to me there was a violation of the no contact order, and I don't think I can win that case. So I decide not to go forward. What was my message to you? It, there's no consequence. All right, there's no consequence. What else? You don't care. I don't care. Maybe I believe him. I'm not going to support you. Who is she likely to tell? That the system didn't work. Not you. Not me. She's going to tell all of her friends, isn't she? I'm not going to waste my time talking to probation. They don't do jack anyway. What's the point? I'm wasting my breath. What's my message to her assailant? There's no consequences, I don't believe her, I may be on his side. Any motivation for him to change or engage in any type of process of self-discovery? None. So I have to really think about my actions and inactions are constantly being evaluated, not only by the person I'm dealing with, but even by my community, because the batter is going to go out and tell people too. Oh, probation even knows my wife's a liar. The judge doesn't believe her. They're not going to support her. So he's going to feel more emboldened, and he's going to embolden other people in our community. We have to figure out how our palace are being evaluated by the people we say we're trying to help. There's a concept called preventative law. It's just to believe that we should look at and anticipate what types of problems could come up in the future. If we went into business with one another, we would meet with an attorney and say, if one of us wanted out of the business, how are we going to separate our things? If I die, do you get the business? Does my partner get 50% of the business? Do you have to buy out my partner? How long does that go? There are certain things in domestic violence we absolutely knew our, our assailants are going to do. Who's the number one person that the batterers call when they go to jail to bail them out? Do you know? The victim, the number one person, pretty much uniformly around the country. Who's the number two person? Everybody. 
Mom, yeah, it's always going to be a woman who's going to get my butt out of jail. That's not true for women who are charged, by the way. But it is true for men who are charged. So <clears throat> the thing, if I know that, I may want to talk to women. If I'm the arrested officer, I might want to say, um, hi, Janice. Uh, you know, oftentimes when I arrest men, they call their wives at night. They cry. They say they're sorry. They didn't mean it. They'll go to counseling. They'll go back to church. They found Jesus. He lives there, you know, right? So um, if he does this, if George threatens you or calls you or tries to manip manipulate you, if you report to us what time he called and what day, we can go listen to the jailhouse calls and we can prosecute him without you even needing to testify. There's something called forfeiture by wrongdoing, right? If he, if he gives that up. So if we inform her, we're going to actually get information. Maybe if this victim's really scared to come forward, but then she knows I can get out of coming forward by giving this over to the prosecution, we may have really enhanced her safety. I can also let the offender. I can say, hey, George, a lot of the guys, when they go to jail, they want to call their wives. They want to call their ex-girlfriends. You're going to say you're sorry. You promised to go to counseling. You go to church. You might even find Jesus. If you do that, and we find out, we're going to prosecute you. So we really want to, I don't want to have a got you probation or a got you system. I want to treat my men with dignity and respect as well. But I want them to know, hey, we're concerned about people's safety, and you're going to be held account to that. And here's what you need to be aware of. So I guess if I was going to make a recommendation to the legislature, I would say really strongly think about asking the police officers, advocates, and prosecutors to inform, to inform victims how jail calls can be reported to the system and what we're going to do with those. If we can use that and, and allow through forfeiture by wrongdoing and our prosecutors are willing to do that, people need to know that that is an option for them. <clears throat> There's another concept called restorative justice. I kind of call it restorative practices because I'm not talking about healing circles and things like that. But I think to the best of my ability, I want to restore victims back to pre-assault phase. So I want to look at any damages that have happened to them because remember, I'm constantly concerned about the clinical message to my assailant and the clinical message to my victim and the clinical message to my community. So <clears throat> I give you an example. I had a victim who was really mad that she lost eight sick days from work. He, her partner had assaulted her, had screwed up her arm. She was a school bus driver. Ann Arbor parents don't like one arm bus drivers, right? So now she had no more sick time. And if her kids got sick, who usually stays home with them? Mom, right? I mean, and that's what adults do. We don't use sick days for ourselves. We go to work sick as a dog. We use our sick days for our children. So she did not have that as an option anymore. When I looked at trying to order him restitution, there was no restitution that could be owed because she got paid, right? She got the sick time, so I couldn't order money. But what did she really lose? She lost her sick days. Now, I was really lucky that this guy also worked for the same school district, and I asked, and I said, well, how many sick days does George have? And she goes, I don't know, he's never sick. So we checked with George's employer. George had 30 sick days in his bank, and his employer was willing to transfer eight sick days from his bank into her bank, therefore restoring her her to predisposition phase. So we talked to George about his personal accountability, about the message and what he caused his partner to, loss, to lose. And we got an agreement for him that he would do this. I got an agreement from the prosecutor. I got an agreement from the batter's intervention program that this would send a message to him that he was responsible for the actions that he did. And I got support from victim services that this would actually support the victim's autonomy and right to self-determination and, and support her kind of personal recovery. So then when I make a recommendation to the judge, I can say, Your Honor, I know this is non-traditional. However, in this case, I had an opportunity to talk to so-and-so from Batter's Intervention, so-and-so from Victim Service. I had an opportunity to talk to the prosecutor. And even the offender agrees that this is a just result. So we need to start thinking about restitution differently. I have some victims who maybe he ripped her $8 blouse from Walmart that was four years old. And she goes, Jim, that blouse means nothing to me. It's not about the blouse. It's not about the money. It's about the message. I'm going to order my offender to pay $8 restitution for that blouse. And he's going to write a check to the court and we're going to mail it to the victim. That lets her know that we don't believe that she or he deserve to lose what they lost as a result of this person's behavior. And it lets the assailant know that he is accountable or she is accountable for all losses that they caused to someone else. Now, now, if you choose to give that check back to your assailant, that's, that's her business, isn't it? It's not my business what she does with it. It's my business to make sure that we're empowering you and sending a good message. Um, 
policy number two, report, police reports then have to document all losses. We need to talk to people and figure out, as a result of this offense, what did you lose? Did he damage, did he destroy? If he broke a $2 figurine, I want that documented. We want people to start looking at that. And we want courts to really start pushing for restitution back on all these things, on all the cases, and thinking of restitution more than just medical restitution. And many times that's all we're really looking at. <clears throat> So, network of partners. I'm going to kind of whip through this really quick. You know, a law enforcement for us, we're very lucky. I have great police officers. They write great police reports. They separate alleged victims from alleged perpetrators. They look at predominant aggressor. They do all the promising practices. Our prosecutor has a no drop clause. That's not true in some communities, right? Some communities, prosecutors are dropping things, are making plea bargains with people all the time. And we need to look at that and examine is that really in the best interest of our community? The defense bar, you know, we have to have a partnership with this person. We want people's rights protected. If my assailant thinks that he's only found guilty because this is a woman's state and we just ship every man up the road, that gives him opportunities not to take responsibility either. I want him to know that his rights were protected, that somebody, you know, let made sure that he had a voice, but he violated and broke the law and he is account of that. If I have the wrong person arrested, I absolutely want their rights protected, don't I? We don't want to supervise people on probation who weren't guilty. And so we want to make sure that our defense counsel is really well trained. Victim services, we got to have a better relationship with them. I'm going to kind of whip through here really quick because what I want to do is just say that if we work correctly and we're sharing information with one another, we can create this wall of support for those who are victimized by violence, right? But we have to be willing to share information. If we're not sharing information with one another, we're not going to do that. And at the same time, I want to create a wall of accountability for that assailant. I want him to know everywhere he goes, we're sharing information. When we've looked at homicides, what we found when we go back and talk to all the people who touched the case, there were people who knew that that victim would get killed. And somebody said, well, how did you know? And they knew different information, but that information oftentimes was missed. And you know what happens? Me as a probation officer, I'm going to work with this family for a year to two years, maybe five years in some states. But you know what? If the police report, I'm not getting a copy of it, I don't know what to happen that night. If I'm not getting the criminal record, I don't even know how dangerous of a guy that I have. If I'm not getting the 911 tape and you expect me to supervise this guy and create some type of change and the only person who's given me any information is him. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that most of my men do not tell me the full truth. All right. They're here to try to paint the picture in as well as a light as they can. And if you're not giving me information, then you get mad. To pro you're not seeing change. It's kind of our fault. You know, and for some of us, we're not even putting them on probation, right? We're only sending them to batter's intervention, and we don't give batter's intervention anything. And then we say, oh, your program doesn't work. Well, you know what? If you're trying to put me on a diet, and I'm too ashamed to tell you that I steal my little brother's Easter candy or Halloween candy right now, right? And that I break in and sneak my mom and dad's alcohol. You could put me on a restrictive diet and watch what I eat for dinner and watch what I eat for lunch. And I'm still going to keep gaining weight, aren't I? Unless you know exactly what's going on with me and I deal with all those shameful things that I don't want to talk about, you're not going to have any workable intervention. So I really, really hope that as we're looking at this system, Every practice we do with the batter, I'm thinking about how does this affect the people that that individual is victimized. And that means not just the person who got assaulted, right? Because when I assault you, I also victimize your children who are in the home. If, if your sister and your brother live there too, I mean, they, I really impact a whole lot of people. And we need to look at how our practices are affecting that. Um, in the end, so I would really like to see that we require that all police and prosecutors immediately submit a police report and orders of protection request, any request that was ever made, and any 911 tapes to the supervising officers and to the batter's intervention program. I'm telling you, it will absolutely change the way you supervise your clients. I had a client, and the police report did a good job, but they wrote what he had done is he had dunked his, dunked his partner in a tub several times, what the police report said. Now, I've been dunked as a kid. I didn't like it, but it wasn't life-threatening. Right, when I listened to the 911 tape, this seven year old girl or eight year old girl was screaming and bawling with so much terror. He's killing my mom, he's killing my mom, and she's bawling. Saying, so, you know, and then you hear the dad in the background, die you effing, you know, die you da 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 da, and you hear the woman being drowned. 
When he came to be interviewed by probation, he was dressed better than me. He was articulate, he was bright, he gave me a firm handshake, looked me straight in the eyes, called me Mr. Henderson, totally respectful. Talked about what a great father he was. He was a little league coach, he did this, he changed diapers. I mean, he was man of the year. And I asked him, I said, well, you pled not guilty, is that right, Mr. George? He goes, yeah, she cheated on me, she did it. I go, okay, okay, I don't really wanna know what she did right now, I just wanna know you pled not guilty. And I go, I mean, I really am amazed at how well you talk about your children, I really appreciate that, and I wish more more men were that engaged with their kids. How would it feel to listen to Melissa's 911, to listen to her call? Because they played it in court, right? And he goes, oh, she's an effing drama queen, just like her mother. She was in the kitchen, we were in the bathroom. She didn't even know what was going on. And I'm like, okay, do I want him having unsupervised visitation? Do I want to look at parenting classes? I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on with the guy, but without that 911 tape, I did not know. He did not sound like Denzel Washington anymore. He sounded like the spawn of Satan, right? The victim who wasn't talking to us, but listening to that 911 tape, I actually understood the absolute fear and terror that went in in the house. And I understood what that child was exposed to. That wasn't caught in a police report. So please think about how are we sharing this information and why aren't we sharing it? Why, that's just common sense. If you want me to do good jobs with this family, I have to have information on this family. <clears throat> Um, policy number four, require batteries interventions as, require battery intervention as a minimum, um, an assessment on all cases to have a basis, uh, intimate partner violence when we reduce to a lesser charge. So sometimes prosecutors are forced to let do a disorderly conduct or some other thing, right? The victim, you're in a lot of danger, you're scared to death of your partner, you're not gonna testify, we're gonna lose the case, so we plea bargain it down. Okay, I understand that. I understand the realities of our world. However, it makes absolutely zero sense if I'm going to take the most da dangerous offenders, zero them down, and give them no intervention. You know what I mean? So we got to think that if it had a basis, if it was intimate partner violence, I would like to see all those people go to batter's intervention. If I can't do batter's intervention, at a minimum, I want them assessed by somebody who understands batter's. I don't want them assessed by a family practitioner or the minister at the church, unless that family practitioner or minister of the church has an extensive training in domestic violence. But we really got to start looking at these families differently and saying, how are we going to help? Now, if the domestic violence was brother to brother, I don't need them in a domestic violence program because our domestic violence programs really look at a gender-based analysis. Right, we're looking at entitlement, we're looking at privilege, because I come from a much more affluent community. I have anesthesiologists, um, chief of psychiatry, um, you know, a lot of very well-educated men on probation for domestic violence. These men function extremely well in their jobs. They bring me letters of recommendation from the deacon. I mean, I'll get piles of recommendations. Can I touch this? They'll bring me piles of recommendations about how good they are. I go, I'm sure you're a great plastic surgeon, Mr. George. That doesn't mean you're not battering your wife. I wasn't interviewing you for a deaconship. I appreciate all this, but let's talk about what happened in that home. So it's not about him losing anger. It's about him feeling he has a right to control and dominate his partner because we live in a society that tells men that they can do that. Some of us engage in a faith that may tell us that we can do that. Um, just like we live in a society that tells me that I get to dominate and control my children, right? I get to punish my children, I get to tell them what they, I, they do. Society ordains that. These men feel society has ordained them to tell their partners what they're going to do. And if they're going to enforce their law, and we got to have an, a, a way to address that with them, and an intervention that actually looks at that entitlement and that privilege. Um, oh, that one worked. So, <clears throat> I say when we look at what we're really trying to do with domestic violence, I kind of say, let's, let's look at what our mission's going to be. In the old days, the court, my mission really was just offender accountability. And that's all I talked to. And I didn't even, we didn't even talk to victims. That was victim services job. That was somebody else's job. I suggest, and our system suggested in Ann Arbor, when we all sat down together, when we got to misdemeanor courts, police, probation, prosecutor, defense counsel, safe house, which is our non-governmental victim services, our batteries intervention, county and city administrators, we sat down for two days and cussed and discussed, if you will, what is our real mission statement here? What are we trying to accomplish? And we said the number one objective had to be to maximize the safety of those victimized by violence. You know, if Johnny comes to court every time on time, pays his course in cost and fines, goes to batter's intervention every week, does all of his homework, and he's still terrorizing his family, we've accomplished nothing. So the number one thing, every policy and practice had to be measured against enhancing victim safety. Probation was not designed when domestic violence was a crime. Not a single one of our policies ever considered victim safety. That wasn't our job. So we got to relook at those policies, don't we? Um, second was ending community tolerance, because we think men batter because they can. 
They batter because we let them get away with it. Because we look the other way, we slap them on the wrist, we send them to a hug a thug class, and we all go home and think we did something. We need to let them know, you know what? You are going to be held account if you use this type of behavior. We are, you're allowed to be frustrated. You're allowed to be angry. You're allowed to file for divorce. You're not allowed to hit, intimidate, abuse, all these other things you're not going to get away with here anymore. And so and once we do that, we think we'll see a huge reduction in domestic violence. Third was holding offenders accountable. So really looking at that paradigm shift and say, what is our job really? And that every practice has to be measured on that. <clears throat> so the number one thing is to maximize victim safety. <clears throat> we believe in order to do that, if I believe victim safety trumps offender accountability, I have to understand what victim safety is. I didn't know how to do that. Nobody did that in the court. So we went through the same 40 hour training that every victim advocate in our county has to go through to do it. Because I said, if I'm gonna work with these men, I need to know what the outcome is on their partners and I need to know how to work with their partners. So I suggested we do that. We got free training from them. We worked from gathering information to providing information to victims. Because sometimes when I ask victims questions, if they were 100% honest with me, I may actually put their life more at risk and be helpful. So I got to say, hey, Janice, I'm going to ask you some really personal questions. And if you are 100% honest with me, sometimes that makes people's lives more difficult or puts them in danger. You're not on probation. You do not have to answer a single question to me. I would prefer you not lie. If I ask you a question you don't want to talk, just say, Jim, I don't want to discuss it, or can we go to the next question, and I'll never document what you refuse to talk about. So then when I'm doing an interview, and every sexual assault question, she cries profusely. Do I have a question mark that she may have been sexually assaulted? Absolutely. But now I can come back at the end and say, you know, Janice, when we talked about sexual abuse, you had a really difficult time. I appreciate that. I'm not going to ask you any questions whatsoever, and I'm not going to document anything. But in my heart, I kind of feel like you deserve the right to talk to somebody who's a specialist on that, who keeps things 100% confidential. I couldn't keep it confidential, but you know what? My friend Kay over at COPE, she has extensive training in, in sexual abuse. She's 100% confidential. She can't tell the court. She can't tell the police. She can't tell anyone. Would it be okay if I had Kay call you just to, so you would have someone to talk to, even if you hang up on her? I've never had someone say no. And then I say, what would be a safe time and a place that I could have Kay do that? Now, I can do that because A, I know Kay has those skills. Two, I know Kay has a flexible schedule because she might say, I'm not talking to anyone until after 8 o'clock at night. I can't talk to someone at work. I can't get calls at work. I'm not going to talk to someone in front of my kids. But 8 o'clock on Wednesday night, my kids go to bed at 8. Anytime after 8 would be fine. I go to bed at 10. Now I can make that referral. So we got to let people know that we're willing to engage in that. Why so much time on victims? Because batterers lie. If my batter, I don't have a pee test for them. You know, drug courts are so lucky. We can just say, hey, pee in this cup. We can pull their hair. I have no way of knowing if my assailant called his wife derogatory names last night or threatened to kill her. I have absolutely no way of knowing that. So I have to really work on empowering the victims. So I would require all supervising officers, whether it be pretrial, probation, parole, anyone like that, to attend the same 40-hour training that all non-governmental victim advocates do in their own community. So if I work here in Albuquerque, I don't get to do the 40-hour training in Santa Fe. I'm going to do it where my clients are because I need to understand Albuquerque's victim shelter. I don't need to understand Santa Fe's. I don't need to understand Alamogordo's, right? So make sure they're doing that. You can probably get that for free, right? The shelters would love to have us know how to work with them better. And if we can't do them for free, I don't think it's a bad way to spend our money because we're going to get really good information and save lives. So we need to start working on that and think about that. <clears throat> The primary responsibility for prosecution that justice is accomplished, we want to know, has justice been done if the system fails to stay involved after conviction? If you have great police officers doing great investigations and great prosecutors prosecuting them and great judges ordering them to do something and then nobody ever follows up to see that he did anything, does a victim believe in the system? No. We wasted all of your guys' time. I mean, great job, cop. Great job, prosecutor. Great job, judge. But we've, we've accomplished nothing. In fact, we've become a joke. Victims aren't going to use us, they're not going to trust us. So we got to stay involved. We got to figure that. If the consequences to the victim are harsher than those given to the defendant. If I break into your house tonight and I lose my job, you're not going to care. You're going to say, you know what, Mr. Henderson, you shouldn't have broken my house. Sucks to be you, right? Excuse my language. But you know what? If I was your partner and I went to jail and our kids lost their health care, or I was your ex-partner and I go to jail and not only does your child lose your health care, you lose the child support and you lose housing, you might feel differently, huh? 
So we got to really look at this and talk about, I want to do this to hold George accountable, but in doing this, I put Teresa more at risk and maybe even make Lisa more dependent on George because when he gets out, that's the only way that she can get off the streets. Right? We're actually emboldening perpetrators by not talking to victims about what's happening to them as a result. I'm not going to talk about the next two just because we're, we're running low on time. But I'd also like to encourage you on your sentencing orders. We know that substance abuse relates to increased domestic violence. It doesn't cause it, right? There's a lot of alcoholics who don't beat their wives. You know what I mean? We, we know that. But we do know that when alcohol is in there, A, it changes my perception. I, I perceive other people's behavior as more aggressive towards me than, it's, than it is. And remember, if I'm an arrogant, self-righteous man, and I believe no woman's going to talk back to me, and no woman's going to challenge me, and now I've been drinking, and maybe you're mad about my drinking or you're mad about whatever and you come at me I'm going to perceive it as you're coming at me from even higher than it is do you think I'm going to be a call to action then? Absolutely. So we got to start working with these men to make sure they're not using drugs, they're not using substances. Now, you see, we wrote ours different. We have no put use or possession of alcohol, illegal drugs, or drug paraphernalia, or being in the presence of anyone known to possess any illegal drugs or drug paraphernalia. That's because none of my clients smoke pot. They all get a ride to work with someone who smokes pot, right? Um, so we just say, you know what? You don't get to get or you don't get to get a ride to work with your pot smoking friends anymore. You can't come to court with your son's pants on and the marijuana in there, right? And they try to tell us that as well. So we're going to try to do that. Firearms, the same thing. Not to possess, purchase, or use any firearms, firearm components, ammunition, or other dangerous weapons, or being in a company of anyone known to possess them. Here's the problem. Great cops. I assault you. Cops come there. They ask if there's any firearms in the home. They remove them. The judge orders me out of the home. I go move in with my brother, who happens to be a militia man and has a whole arsenal of firearms, and no one ever asked me. Who did we take guns away from? Only the victim, right? Who may or may not wanted the guns, but that's the only person we took guns away from. So we need to start letting these men know this is a federal offense. You cannot have these firearms. We know that lethality increases by like six times, you know, from all of Jacqueline Campbell's things. So when we're dealing with dangerous men, we need to make sure that they understand they cannot have firearms. It's a reality of the, of the life that they, they've caused themselves. <clears throat> Some other things to think about for sentencing recommendations. Um, we have uh, created a, a one-day class on DV effects of domestic violence. My men all think they're great fathers. Oftentimes their victims think they're great fathers. They'll say he's a horrible man to me, but he's a good dad. You know, and so we want these men to realize how children exposed to violence affects them. And honestly, we've gotten a lot of movement from some guys. Because let's say this is my ex-wife and I hate her. I'm mad at her. I can't stand her. I know, I know I would never hate you, but if, if that was the case, case, um, you send me to batteries intervention program, you try to do empathy training and all this, I, that doesn't work. I meant to hurt her. You know what I mean? You're not going to make me feel bad about that. But then I might actually love my daughter and son, Johnny and Melissa. And when you show me and look at developmental stages and what I'm doing to harm that, I got to come to terms with that. Maybe my love for Johnny and Melissa is higher than my hatred towards Patrick and uh, Patricia. And I got to, I got to examine that. So we really want to look at, and we created that class. I would look at mandating all the clients to go to New Mexico Workforce Connection every Monday at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock, whatever time they open, and make them turn in job applications that are not employed. A lot of my clients work under the table. Their victims tell me, he's a painter, he's this, he's a, he says he doesn't. He doesn't want to pay for batteries intervention, he doesn't want to pay for child support, he doesn't want to do this. So you know what? If you're not working, Mr. George, since all lethality indicators saying unemployment is one of the highest predictors of reassault and lethality, you're going to be working for me. So we're going to give you, I was in DeKalb County the other day in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and even under PPO courts, which order protection courts and um, <clears throat> They gave the guy 60 days to get a job through like Atlanta Works. If he didn't get a job within 60 days, to them he had to do 28 hours of community service every week for Atlanta water treatment plant. And he had to go in at 8 o'clock three days a week. And their goal was, they said, you know what, if you haven't worked in so long, no one's going to hire you because you have no work history and you don't have no habit of getting up early. So I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you 60 days to get a job on your own with the help of, you know, Atlanta Works. And if that doesn't work, we're going to do this and try to make you get established. And he says, then all of a sudden guys realize they're doing 28 hours of free work for the court. They can go ahead and get a job somewhere. And for me, when I required my clients to do this stuff, all of a sudden they come in the next week and they say, Mr. Henderson, I got a job. 
Oh, really? What are you doing? I'm painting. Oh, now the victim told me he'd been painting all along, but he just got a job. So we need to figure out. The other thing I would say, is child support, spousal support, make absolutely sure we're mandating this because men use economic abuse against their partners to get back into the home or to force her to come back to them. So we want to look at that. If uh, your client's in recovery and he's not working or she's not working, I would have them go AA daily. There's nothing wrong with daily AA. It ca it's free. It keeps you off the streets, it keeps you busy, it helps you clear your head. When they get a job, they can go down to two times a week or three times a week or whatever you uh, uh, de determined was appropriate. Same thing with batter's intervention. We do batter's intervention three times per week for men who are not employed. The reason why, if we say women are at the most risk when I'm not employed, when do I need the most supervision? when I'm not employed, don't I? Really, I mean, that makes sense. And think about it, we do every other thing we do. Substance abuse is not a magic number, go once a week for this one. We have outpatient, intensive outpatient, residential. Mental health, we have different levels, everything. But domestic violence, oh, it's just once a week. I say, you know what, once a week for first time offenders who are taking ownership works. Once a week for high risk offenders, I don't do. I do three times per week for the first 90 days for my really high risk offenders. I do three times per week for my guys who are unemployed. Now our shelter, I mean our batter's intervention program was willing to take the other two times and didn't charge us for that because we didn't want economics to be away. So that is a problem for communities to figure out are we going to bankrupt our shelters, I mean or bankrupt our batter's intervention programs. For us we didn't have huge numbers that were up there that were unemployed. We didn't have huge numbers that were high risk and we made the other guys pay and follow through with that so it worked. So you know just consider that, kind of look at that in your communities. Um, Post disposition, do you like the truth or consequences there? See, uh, I got lost there one time. Um, <laughs> but prosecute all pro pro probation violations. Offenders need to re receive swift, clear, meaningful, and predictable and certain consequences for violations. If they think they're going to get away with it, they're going to keep doing it. I think I'm going to get away with speeding, right? If they, mad, if they put these spikes in the road and had these cameras up there, and the minute it seemed that I went 71, the spikes went up and my tires went flat, I would quit speeding, wouldn't I? But I know I'm going to get away with it. I count on that. These men do too. We have to create a system. We do a judicial review. 30 days into probation, you have your first review. Every skipped batter's intervention class, you have to do one day jail work program and make up that class. You get two weeks to make them up. For everything you didn't make up, you do two days jail. Once we started doing that, we had significantly less people skipping classes. Now we do judicial reviews every 90 days. If they're 100% compliant, I excuse them from court. But they have to do that work. And if they don't do that work, then they're going to have to account to the judge. And we're going to take care of it. And it's consistent. And that really needs to happen. Um, judicial review. So I'm kind of talking about that. They're only as effective as the information we give the judge. I gotta let this judge know. Has he picked up any new crimes? Have I talked to the victim? Is he paying his child support? Is he, how's he doing in batter's intervention? Is he paying for the class? Is he engaged? Is he working on it? Um, so we know we want to make sure that it, probation's giving judges the right information. If you have a court that doesn't have probation and you can't afford compliance, I would still suggest judges could do compliance on, re, uh, reviews. And I to actually probably think they should do it more so because they have no one watching that assailant. So, you know, and let's say if we don't want to do it at first, get prosecuted to say at least they're high risk cases. Let's bring those back before the judge every 30 days, every 90 days, every, you know, four months, whatever you decide can work in your court. And I have to bring in a report. Right? So if I'm in batter's intervention, make me come to the court, bring proof that I'm going to the class, proof that I'm paying my child support, proof that I'm doing this. But we need to let these men know they're being watched by someone. And if we don't have probation and parole and those people, let's have it be the judge or the prosecutor or whoever we need to do. <clears throat> Um, so I would like to see more mandated designated dockets. Designated dockets cost zero money. So if you don't have any grants, we just say, you know what? Normally all of you guys are here for a misdemeanor criminal offense. Some of you are shoplifters, some of you are drunk drivers, some of you are domestic violence. We're going to say instead of doing from 8 to 2, dealing with all your cases, from 8 to 11, we're going to do all the DVs together. What that does, it gives me time to really be focused on DV, to be victim-centered. Victim services can send a victim advocate there and only spend that part 
part of the day instead of being there all day or three days in a row, right? So we save resources for the advocates who never have enough funding. We save resources that have a designated prosecutor possibly that's committed to domestic violence and understands. We can have designated defense bar there who understands domestic violence, right? We want defense bar to know what they're doing. If, you're, if you didn't commit a crime, you used resistance violence against me because I've been battering you for 10 years and a cops felt they had to arrest you, well, you want your rights protected, don't you? You, don't, you want justice achieved. So we want to figure out how we can do that. It doesn't cost us any money, right? And then we can just do our reviews right after that and they don't have to take a lot of time. If the guys are doing things they're supposed to do, we'll move on. <clears throat> All right, this is how I do batter's intervention. I don't have the perfect, I had a perfect court <laughs> when I worked in Ann Arbor for my judge there. They were really good judges. We had great prosecutors. You know, our batter's intervention program really worked hard with us. In Detroit, sometimes we have good judges, sometimes we don't. It's a really big system. Sometimes we have, you know, educated probation officers, sometimes we don't. Oftentimes our clients are not ordered to do, to not do drugs. So I make a requirement in my batter's intervention, you have to do random drug testing. And I think probation should know if you're doing math on a regular basis. If you're coming to class high on cocaine, I want them to know that, so I report it back. I also require that if you're required to do any other thing, you have to bring me proof every week. So he brings me his proof of AA, he brings in his proof of substance abuse treatment. So that way, what I'm trying to do, go back to that circle, that wall of accountability, I want him to know that I, will, I believe in wraparound services. You know, Mr. George, I'm concerned about your battering, but I'm also concerned about your sobriety. If he's in mental health counseling, supposed to be doing medication for his schizophrenia or bipolar disease, or, is he doing that? And I'm gonna watch this stuff, especially if he's not being supervised by an intensive probation department that has the time to look at that. I'm gonna do that, it takes me 30 seconds per client. You come in, you sign in, you do this, you show me your A slip, you show me your battery, you know, your treatment slip, you show me your substance, your uh, mental health slip. That takes very little time to save someone's life, to make an impact. And because I'm friends with the people in our community, the substance abuse agencies are doing the same thing. I, I sign a sheet for them every week. They take their substance abuse agency. So now he's being watched by a probation officer. He's being watched weekly by me. He's being watched weekly by a substance abuse agency. If he's in mental health, he might be being watched weekly by them. Think about that collaboration there and the message to him that we're all kind of creating this circle. So, wraparound intervention, multiple people watching the batter, able to identify non-compliance immediately. Let's say this week he, he tested positive for cocaine, I mean marijuana. He forgot to bring in his proof of AA. Doesn't mean he's not going, but he didn't bring it to me. And he forgot to bring in his proof of substance abuse. I send that notice to the probation right away. Probation could get on the phone, call the substance abuse agency. Is he coming? Is he doing this? We can let the victim know he's relapsed. Some victims are really concerned about that, aren't they? If he's using, she knows that's a danger thing. Yeah. Now, some probation says we can't tell her. You know, it's confidential. His drug testing. You know what? Once you file a violation, it's no longer confidential. So I file a violation immediately, alleging that he tested positive for marijuana on this day and he didn't go to substance abuse. Now I can tell the victim, I can call and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, your husband, uh, I, I filed a violation against your husband for allegedly testing positive for this, allegedly not going to class, allegedly not doing that. She can create a different safety plan, can't she? So we really want to think about how we're doing that. <clears throat> so require all batters intervention providers to document other interventions and report it weekly to the court or to the probation agent. It doesn't take them that long to do that. I would also, if we're funding any, if we're funding substance abuse or we're funding mental health, we may want to figure out, can we get them on board too? Can we make this not just BIP doing this work? Can we have the whole community showing a message that domestic violence is serious and we're concerned about it? Um, <clears throat> I would require batters intervention programs to have a working me memorandum, uh, MOU, I'm not gonna say the word, but you know what I'm talking about, right? And uh, a relationship with victim services. Because batters intervention needs to know that if our policies and practices are putting victims at risk. And not always will victims be able to come and tell us that. So I like to have an open door policy that bat any victim service agency provider can come watch my batters intervention group without forewarning. You just show up. Because if I made you come tell me ahead of time, I could change my plan 
couldn't I? Ooh, I know they'll like me to do this topic. You know, no, I want to have you walk in, you sign a release, and you won't talk about what the clients are there, but you're really there to evaluate me. Is my program worthy? I also have an open door policy for probation and parole. They can come in any time. You know what? If I use the coercive power of the court to mandate that my client go to a batter's intervention program, I have a moral and ethical obligation to know that that program's not going to put victims and children at risk. And the only way I'm going to know that is to get off my rear end and go watch the program. And if the program doesn't want you coming and watching them, say, that's okay, you no longer get referrals from me. Get your referrals from the church, get them from the newspaper, do whatever you want, but I am responsible for my clients and I'm going to know that the programs in my community are not putting people at risk. And, and I think we really need to strongly, strongly consider doing both of those things. Um, I do probation group reporting with my clients because when I'm trying to do all this stuff, go watch batteries intervention programs, go work with the substance abuse providers, go to the coordinated community response meetings, go to domestic violence court, I don't have as much time to supervise my guys. And I found that every time I talk to you, you need the same pep talk, the same butt chewing, right, the same threats. And in the beginning, I met with a whole bunch of guys and at the end of the day, I call, I listen to my messages on the phone. To Two victims called and had to be called back before five. The judge had called three times and it's now 510, right? And my boss doesn't want me working overtime anyway. So I said, you know, shoot, I could have just had client number one talk and taped them and I could have made every other client listen to the tape and said, here, leave this form. So I decided to see people in the group. It did a lot of things for me. A, research supports it. It says that when we have a supportive group environment, that in many other cases, people needed less intervention, less structure, even mental health. Some people needed less medication. So why not try that with probation? And what it really helped me is, all right, I call on this, you're going to be a gentleman just for purposes of my class. I call on this gentleman and say, hey, how are you doing in the class? I ain't going to the class. I got a wife and three kids to take care of. Oh, really? Well, anybody else here have a wife and three kids to take care of? A whole bunch of hands come up. Well, let's talk. You know, Stan, how about you? How many kids you got? I got five kids. Holy cow, you must not be going to class either. Oh, no, I'm going to class. Well, how about someone else? So, so we get like five people. They're all going to class. Well, you know what? Maybe they don't like, love their children and wife as much as you do. Let's check on this. Do you guys love your children and wife? Okay, they do. Anybody here ever have um, the ethics like George here? A bunch of hands go up. Hey, well, what did the judge do to you, Michael? She gave me one day jail for every day I missed. What did the judge do to you, Thomas? She gave me one day jail for every day I missed. What would she do to you, Stan? She gave me one day jail for every day I missed. George, if I was a bet man, what do you think the judge is going to do when we go to court? She's going to give me one day jail for every day, right? I no longer get in power struggles with my clients. I don't tell them what they have to do. I don't tell you, it's your life. You say, no, George, I understand you want to spend two hours a week more with your wife and kids. Let's do this. Hey, guys, when the judge sent you to jail, did she let you take your wife and kids? They all laugh, right? So now, George, you got to, you're giving up two hours and you're going to lose 24. What do you want to do? Well, sounds like I'm going to have to go to that dang class, right? Well, I kind of think you might want to do that too. Anybody have, I have to file a violation against George, don't I, guys? They all know I do. And you know what my recommendation is going to be, right, George? You do. All right, so anybody have ideas for George? Because he doesn't want to go to jail that much. You guys start telling jail how he can get, George, how he can get back compliant, right? Now, he gets multiple ideas how to do that. But think about, I also educated this person who just started a group today and had, she's going to get ready to skip, because they all do, right? And they're going to say, holy cow. How that's not going to work for me. So I saved time, but dramatically increased my compliance rate overnight. Batteries intervention programs that we used to believe clients couldn't complete, that they weren't getting into them on time, they were never completing them on time, magically changed our compliance rates without the batteries intervention program changing anything. You know who needed to change? We did. We can't put the blame on someone else all the time. Once in a while, I gotta say, how am I supporting batteries intervention? How am I supporting victim services? And I need to be a part of that solution. Um, so, all right, uh, let me see. So, probation group meeting actually increased my time for victim contacts. A lot of courts aren't talking to victims. How the heck do I know if my practices are helpful to people if I'm not talking to them? I had to have that time. I separated it by the different batteries intervention program. We felt it really supported successful completion of probation. Because you know what? I haven't ever been on probation. I don't know how to manage going to batteries intervention, doing drug testing, going to jobs, paying cost and, and maneuvering through all of that but some of you guys are doing it very successfully so if you're having roadblocks let's hear about it let's try to break it down and figure out how to help this person work through it and you know what if we can't figure it out then I can go back to my supervisor or I can go back to the bad 
debtor's intervention program or I can go back to the shelter and said, we're screwed. We got a problem here. We're ordering people to do things that they can't do. We have a broke system. What are we going to do to fix it? Before, we would just blamed it on that person and thrown them in jail, wouldn't we have? That's not accomplishing anything. We got to really think about how we're doing this. Um, they start to address legitimate concerns and they really can learn from other clients. I mean, it's amazing. And some of my guys have never really been successful before. Right? They're not always the most powerful guys. These are guys that feel that they've been beaten down and kicked around too. And so when I get a guy who managed to finish his GED, has been sober now for a year, who's on, you know, session 50 of the Batteries Intervention Program, almost done. And I'm like, you know, George, I'm just amazed at all the stuff that you've accomplished since you've been here. Can you help Michael? Understand, you know, how did you do that? You know, and George gets to feel good about what he's accomplished and what he's done. And he's able, and then Michael can realize, you know what? If toothless, homeless George got all of his act together and was able to do it, you're going to be able to do it too, Stan, and we're going to help you do that. So we, it really has been helpful to us. Um, the old way, I could see maximum a day, 14 clients, right? And no time for even a smoke break, right? I mean, I was just working client, client to client. I don't smoke, but bathroom break or whatever. The new way, I could easily see 60 clients with time to spare. And I would challenge that I had better relationships with my clients, that my clients understood the consequences of their actions and what type of uh, sanctions would be imposed in court um, than all of my probation, fellow probation officers who are busting their rear ends trying to meet all these clients individually. And they're, they're having huge compliance issues. When I go to court and you go to jail for those four, five days that you skip class, you don't even fight it because it's just kind of like you knew all along that that was going to happen. And I'm able to tell the judge all the things we did to support you not having that happen. So it's just so much easier. And people feel that they were dealt with with respect and dignity, not screwed over. And I don't want my clients to feel that I'm just beating them up. That's not my goal. My goal is saying, I'm here to support you, but you are going to be held to account. And we're going to do whatever we can. But you know, in the end, it's up to you. And I'll support you going to jail if that's what you want to do. All right, so some other creative sanctions we could look at. Um, I would say have some sanction for even minor violations. We, we talk about graduated sanctions all the time. Sanctions don't have to be, sometimes we wait and I let you screw up, screw up, screw up, screw up. Now I'm mad and I throw you in jail. And it doesn't help you and it doesn't help the victim. If I can catch you much more quickly, it might be, I might end up just having you go to court and sit in the back of the courtroom for two hours while I'm there, right? I might have the judge bring you up and have you sit there while he contemplates what he's going to do. We might have you do extra batteries intervention programs and do more drug testing or whatever, but there needs to be violations when guys don't do things. My guys forget to bring in their AA sheet. They're like, well, I'm just going to bring it in tomorrow. No, I don't change my schedule because you forgot something. Now you're going to have to come into court on Wednesday from 9 to 11 bring it then and I'll come get it for you now next time he's gonna think I had to give up two hours because of this you know so I would say jail availability to be straight over be, despite overcrowding we had to really work on that for a while all of our domestic violence guys always became trustees easiest and they're always being released and we try to say can we release the nonviolent offenders first you know let's save our jail for the guys we're scared of not the guys who made us angry. And sometimes those are the guys who are in jail, the guys who made us angry. We need to really rethink that. Um, we created a batter's intervention program in the jail. Now part of that was because we thought about, okay, our most scariest guys, the ones we're most scared of, we throw in jail and give nothing to. And our low risk guys, we send all sorts of intervention. It just seemed kind of foolish, didn't it? And so what we did is we created a program that's 12 weeks long, or tw and, and it's um, three times a week that they go. We check, maybe it's 12 sessions um, in like six weeks. Um, but it's, it's like three times a week, I know that, for a certain period of time. And we don't call it batter's intervention, we call it batter's intervention preparation program. You know, like if you go into college and you're not real good at math, you gotta take a college prep class in math, or you gotta do a college prep class in English before you can get into the real school. That's kind of what we're doing. You know what, George, you got a little bit more work to do than Thomas here. We're gonna send you to a prep class, and we're gonna make it free, and we're gonna make sure you have easy transportation there. Um, now, sometimes if he does really good in that class, we'll release him out to the regular batter's intervention program. Now we had the regular batter's intervention doing it. We paid them to come in and do the class for us. The benefit to that was when I let George out and George starts decompensating or doing bad, the batter's intervention program, they know George. They're like, he's not the same guy he was in jail. Something's up. So it really kind of helped make that happen. We also created a batter's intervention at our homeless shelter. And I'll tell you why. 
A lot of people who are victimized at the shelter don't trust us as a system, right? If you assaulted me, beat me up and stole my crack, and I was really mad and I called the police officers, I told them that, are they going to be too sympathetic towards me? No. First, I'm homeless, I might have a mental illness, so there's those issues that we had to deal with. The fact that crack was involved, they're going to dismiss things, I may not be a real reliable witness. So they don't really trust the system, yet this population was constantly being violated. You know, we know that people that hang out at shelters sometimes, we get some real predatorial behavior, don't we? So the shelter created a program that they would order people to as a requirement to be in their program. So if they heard of any type of predatorial behavior, they would order that person to it. We had a county grant that paid for it. We even paid batterers to go to it. What we did is you got one bus token for every week you came in a row. So this is your 12th week. You got 12 bus tokens. Now the bus tokens were hopeful that you would get jobs with it and you'd use them the correct way. Some may have used it for alcohol, let's be honest. But in the end, our guys kind of were proud about how many tokens they could get. And if you ever missed one session, you started over on one. It didn't matter if I had a seizure and I was in the hospital. There was no excuse. You just started over. But guys would brag, I'm up to 12 tokens. You know what I mean? And they were proud of themselves, but they were trying to do work. And these were people who were not involved in the criminal justice system. So we got to think outside of business as usual if we're really talking about making our community safer. Um, so, I would look at immediate entry into batter's intervention. You guys heard from Gandalf earlier on. He may have talked about that the most offenses and the most violent offenses usually happen within the first 90 days. If we're waiting a year to get him into treatment, we've really done a disservice, haven't we? Um, if I go home and find out my dog urinated on the carpet two days ago when I left to come here and I go rub its nose in, is it going to learn anything from that? No, it has to be immediate. So we need to make intervention much quicker. In the old days, it took us three to four months to ever get a guy in a batter's intervention. He'd be sentenced by the judge, he'd come see me, I would have him sign a release, I'd mail that off to the batter's intervention program, they would mail the offender a packet, the offender would then fill the packet and have to get into the program. He'd come see me the first month, he hadn't got in there yet, I'd yell at him, tell him you better get in in a hurry. The next month, he still hadn't got in there, I yelled at him again. The third month, I yelled at him, I filed a violation with the court, he went before the judge, and the judge yelled at him, sent him back to the program, and then, you know, now all of a sudden we're six months into it I'm back before the judge now and probation's almost up maybe and guys we're never doing anything now I have most of my clients start batter's intervention before they even get sentenced and I say you know what Pam I'm not the judge I can't order you to this program however the judge listens to my recommendations 90% of the time we have three programs in, in the county here's how they're modeled here's what's going on this is a program I think would be most helpful to you it'd really be in your best interest if we had you in that program before you went to court it would show the judge you're taking this seriously. It would, you know, would show the prosecutor that you're, not, you know, that you're not screwing around. And if you really hate the program, you could say something right then. You know, what do we got to do to make that happen? And so now, literally 90% of my clients start batter's intervention before we even get sentenced. In the old days, it was six months easy, probably for 60 to 70% of them. Um, I would look at long-term batter's intervention. I know some people don't agree with that. Here's my thoughts. If I was a racist Ku Klux Klansman, do you think you would change my racism in a 26-week class? Honestly? I mean, it takes a long time to deal with privilege, entitlement, all these things. These men have grown up in a society that supported their belief that they're entitled to this, they're privileged to this. We're not going to fix that in a 26-week class. They might learn to talk to talk. But it's going to take time. I know people who've been sober for 30 years and still go to AA regularly, like consistently. And I'm like, Merle, why do you go to AA? You seem to got that drinking problem licked. He says, Jimmy, it's not a drinking problem. It's a thinking problem. I live in a society that makes it way too easy for me to go back and drink and do and live the lifestyle I lived before. I need to be reminded. I need to see new people struggling with it. I need to remember where I came from. And I got, no, need to stay focused on where I'm going. And I think a lot of batterers need longer term. I honestly kind of think 20 years from now, the batter's intervention programs will be more lifelong, that there will be more support like that. Um, I'd like to look at two to three times per week for higher risk clients. I'd like you to at least talk about that. Restitution, remember, it's not just about money. What did that victim lose as a result of their behavior? Let's figure out a way to hold that person more accountable. You know, attend court weekly, look at other graduated sanctions. 
If possible, I'd like to see more designated probation officers, more designated prosecutors if you have that option. If you can't afford probation officers, sometimes you do designated compliance officers or even in civil court for orders of protection, we're seeing compliance officers being used. Um, I would look at how probation is linked to batteries intervention and victim services. You absolutely have to send your supervising agencies to training with victim services. I have to know how, well, how my behavior affects them. Home visits, if possible, we get to take the drug dog. So once in a while I take the drug dog like once a year and I find out who has drugs in their house. It's amazing the amount of people who are using who I think aren't. And we bring them in the first time, I bring them here to the group reporting. None of you are using, praise God, right? You all told me you're all clean and sober. We bring Lassie in and two of you have pot on you, <laughs> right? And um, so I had one client, I came and I did this training, I came back like three years later or two years later and he said they wouldn't let him use a drug dog. So uh, he was a, a sex offender supervisor, so he said he took his own dog and told his clients it was a porn sniffing dog and two clients turned over their porn. Now, I, I have no idea what porn smells like, but it works for them. Um, <laughs> judicial reviews, really strongly look at those. The National Council of Juvenile and Family Court judges supports it. The Prosecuting Association support it. Really look at that. Have your judge and your system consider that. Remember, accountability really starts at the beginning, but it has to be a systems perspective. If I have really good fencing around my cattle farm and there's a big hole in the back of it. Do you think my cattle are going to stay in? No, they're going to get out. We have to figure out where our holes are, where are our clients escaping, and where are our victims falling through, and what do we do to patch up those holes, and how do we work to support one another? Okay, with that, probation working smarter, not harder, while being fiscally responsible. I um, appreciate your time very, very much, and um, if you have any questions, I'm very open to hearing them, and thank you. Any questions? So hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Do you coordinate with the family court? Do I coordinate with the family court? In my probation department, we didn't in the sense of like divorce court and orders of protection. We ran, um, so I did a, le a lean check on you. I had to do a criminal background check. So I would know that you're going through divorce and I actually talk with the victim so I know what's going on there. We get, when I submit my order to the judge, I give her the current police report, the current order of protection, any prior police reports that have been written on the, the assailant and any prior orders of protection, even if they weren't by you. So I say, I'm, this is the first time he assaulted you, but he's had two other prior orders of protection against him and three other police reports written against him. The judge is going to get all of that because we're trying to look at it contextually, right? Our criminal justice system looks at it from a system. Court can get what you guys are we're going to share that with them. Thank you. Um, we're going to share that information with them and our judge is going to try because we really don't like, like I say you can't have visitation, this judge says you can't have visitation, right. so we try to share that information. We're from a small enough community and my judge has a good enough relationship so she can reach out. Some courts are doing unified courts now where they're having one judge deal with all of those cases. You know, I know in New York that's really big and some other states are doing that. Because that, uh, that, and then there's also the children's court issues because then Right, well that's what they do the same the thing. If, if you look at the New York model, that's what they do with their integrated court because then they'll have like the, the attorney for the child, right, the guardian at litem and all those people are at everything. Okay. So we're talking about the order of protection, we're talking about probation, we're talking about child custody and they're doing all of that. Perfect. We don't do that in Ann Arbor but I know they're doing that around the country. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. My first question is when you're talking about low. Yeah, both. <clears throat> Maybe I have to do this. Is that <laughs> when you're talking about low and high risk um, categories, how, what, are you, what assessment are you using well, to, to think about people that way? Okay, so some people use like Jacqueline Campbell's assessment thing, but now Jacqueline Campbell's assessment thing was really meant for victims, right? And it really wasn't supposed to always come to the probation department. I still do that with victims, but I let her absolutely know that this information is discoverable. Everything I have, I'm the eyes and ears of the court. So anything she tells me, he gets access to. Now some people say they never talk to the victim about that. I said, you know what? No. She gets to make her own choices. Don't silence victims because we know what's best for them. That's ridiculous. You know what? Let her know what's going to be used with the information. Let her know how it can be helpful and harmful. And let her make her own choices. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about empowering people. Other types of measurements. Some people use the LSR. Some people are using the Odera and have really good success with that. Jacqueline Campbell wants corrections to use the Odera more because if they're not really trained in how to work with victims, I may forget to tell you that I'm going to share it and then put you at risk. If I do that one time, 
it, that's all it takes, right? So we got to be really careful in that we know that if we're going to start sharing that information, how well trained are the staff? Are they really well trained or are we just saying they're well trained? Are they committed? So if you just go to the ADERA, you don't need to talk to the victim. It all comes from his prior history, his stuff. I do more of a biopsychosocial because I really try to look at it contextually and look at a variety of things. And I think the ways that we ask questions, I can, I rarely have an isolated first time offense. Even when clients come in and swear to me on a stack of Bibles, it's an isolated first time offense and the victim does. But the way that I ask the questions makes it more comfortable for people to disclose that. We can talk about that training too, but it'd take too long. But if you call me, I would love to go over it with you. So the other thing is I'm a little ignorant to the structure of probation and parole state to state and maybe even in our own. So I'm wondering what level you're recommending making these policy changes at. Is this something that would happen locally or is there a level that we can reach that would allow it to trickle down? And and moving, I, yeah. I do not know. No, I will tell you that every state's different. Like in the state of Michigan, circuit court, which is felonies, are all state employees. District court are all county employees. And in 1979, they even passed an ordinance that a city could have their own. So I worked for a city court for the city of Ann Arbor and then when you heard the thing it said I worked for Washtenaw County I jumped over and did worked at the trial court for the county for a minute um, and so then that's and in some courts don't even have probation I was in Alamogordo and I think they have a nonprofit agency that runs their probation so that's not even I thought they were non are they for profit no. But they're not the court or the substance or like drunk driving thing. Employees. They're county employees now. Okay. Yeah, DWI. All right. Magistrate court yeah. compliance. Okay. So I, I think I don't. I I think we have to kind of look at that and, and look at what the state can legislate and then what communities need to look at. Um, you recommend uh, parenting classes. You were saying. Uh, I know the majority of our clients they are with the victims. So I wondered, what about coupling, couples counseling? Okay, well, I, I wouldn't do couples counseling. And, and the reason why, couples counseling, they say we're supposed to be on the same ground. And there actually has been some incidents. And I even had a client who assaulted his wife at marriage counseling because she dared to say stuff that she would never say anywhere else. And he wanted to let her know that. It was a marriage counselor was the one who called the police, which is, that's very rare. But it, it just happens once, it's too much. So we prefer to see men deal with their battering over here. And if victims need to do their own work, they do it over here at the end if they're both accountable and they choose this together and they decide to go to marriage counseling they can but that's in addition to not as a requirement for the court right for the parenting classes we never order victims to do anything I don't right my judge wouldn't but if they choose to go to the parenting class with him, we can't stop that. I mean, that's the parenting class is done outside of the court. We have lots of free classes in our state, and we went and worked with them because they had, they called it anger management, did stuff. So we really educated the people who are doing the parenting classes on domestic violence and their dynamics before they started working with our family. So they realized, you need to know who might be coming in your door. And really, from some of my guys, we had parenting on your own, which before I didn't, right? You took care of a lot of that stuff. And we know that some women will stay with their batters because they want to protect their child. If you know I'm going to get visitation with them, I'm going to get them on weekends and I'm going to have them, you might be way too scared for that to happen, so you stay with me. So we had to kind of create some skills. And for some of these men, they all think they're good guys. They'll say this, well, spare the rise, spoil the child. I turned out okay. I go, look where you're at. You know, you, maybe you didn't turn out okay. You're here in a domestic violence class. Let's look at that and let's figure out how to make it where our kids don't end up here. So um, I, I wouldn't do the marriage conversation. Counseling, I would say that if families choose to go to parenting classes together, they can make that choice. But I would talk to victims about the pros and cons of that, and I'd make sure that victim services knew that too. I just wanted to touch base on your question about probation and parole in New Mexico. So a lot of the domestic violence cases are through magistrate court. They're misdemeanor offenses. So, you know, when we're just kind of going over our presentation, because I work for felony probation and parole. So with the felony, our officers go to the field. So we're doing home checks, we're in the field, um, you know, so that it's, it's just a lot more, it's not just an office visit. Um, we're gonna look at that whole spectrum. So exactly what Jim was talking about, we do. So I think when we're talking about the level at what it sounds like, like through a BIP program, what a lot of, I think, probationers that are on magistrate court, I know that their system is totally different. The officers don't go to the field. Okay, so they're not in the field, to my knowledge. They're not, they don't go into the field for misdemeanor court. So maybe we need to discuss something like that. The other thing, too, is I've never heard of a specific domestic violence unit through magistrate court. So basically, you're going to have your, 
you know, domestic violence cases, any other misdemeanor offenses, and your DWI cases. So that officer has a total mixture of all sorts of different cases, which you have to supervise differently as well. So I think as a recommendation, you know, a specific uh, domestic violence unit at that level would be great where you can mandate a certain amount of compliance. So even if it's at the magistrate level, you have those officers going in the field. Um, they're expected to do that. Um, it's through policy and they're mandated to do that. So does anybody know, Hold sorry, on. again, like, so is there a statewide structure over magistrate well, I, th I think they want you taped, don't you? Oh. Uh. You can hear? Is oh, there a okay. statewide structure over magistrate courts, or is no. magistrate well, court? Well, it's so magistrate court is you know your so it's, it's going to be through your counties, and then right. you have your magistrate judges that oversee that. Right. You know, so like for felony probation and parole, you have your district judges, and we're all state employees. So every felony probation and parole officer, we're probation and parole because we deal with state parolees and state probationers. Okay, so we oversee that process. With magistrate, it's usually through your county. So it, it's separate. So that could look very different. What they do in Alamogordo could be very different than what they do in Albuquerque. So there's no uniformed kind of process there. Um, so in Albuquerque, they may be doing it right. They may have a lot more resources to use. But in some of your smaller towns, it may be a little different as well. So. And sometimes having a unit is impossible. Like we did in the beginning, we didn't have a unit, but we had the judge just decided one agent was going to do all DV, and so I was that agent. So that I, I was the unit. You know what I mean? But I, I. But before I had drunk driving, homeless, urinating in public, all those people on probation. I mean, I was at a misdemeanor court. Mm -hmm.